When we're in straight and level, unaccelerated flight, our aircraft is said to be in equilibrium. Our rate of climb or descent is constant, or in this case is zero, and we're holding altitude, and our speed stays the same. The forces that are acting on the airplane, lift, weight, thrust, and drag, are forcing the aircraft in certain directions at certain magnitudes, which we can measure in pounds. Our aircraft weighing 2,000 pounds will have 2,000 pounds of lift acting on it in order to stay in equilibrium. In the same way, the amount of force from thrust will be just enough to keep the plane at the same speed by countering the force of drag. Let's have a closer look at drag to see how it affects our climb performance. There are two general categories of drag we want to look at. The first might be easier to think of. The air we fly in has mass, and as we fly faster through it, more of that mass will be impacting our aircraft, trying to force us in the opposite direction we're traveling. It won't actually push us in the opposite direction, of course, because as we slow down, we lessen the amount of air mass pushing on us. This is called parasite drag. Think of sticking your head out the window of a stopped car and then doing the same thing as you're going 70 on the highway, and you'll understand why parasite drag increases as our speed increases. So we can graph this relationship on a drag curve, with our true airspeed in knots on the horizontal, and the drag force in pounds on the vertical. As our speed increases, our parasite drag increases. So our curve looks like this. Notice the dramatic increases, we really pick up speed. The other form of drag we want to look at is a bit more esoteric. It's called induced drag because it's a product induced by the production of lift. If you remember the lift equation, you know that part of what goes into lift is speed. If we reduce that speed and want to maintain the same amount of lift, we need to increase angle of attack. This causes our lifting force to develop a bit of a rearward vector. Even though it's still lift, we can think of the rearward component of it as just drag by another name. Increasing angle of attack also increases the wingtip vortices generated by our wing, which have a drag effect as well as they mix with moving air. The slower we fly and the more we need to increase our angle of attack, the more of this induced drag we have to accept. So the relationship between speed and induced drag looks a bit different. Here, as speeds increase, our induced drag gets lower. Now, as far as the four forces of flight are concerned, we don't make a distinction between induced or parasitic drag. Drag is drag. So what we really want to know is our total drag. We can add up the distances from the horizontal axis of each curve to get our total drag at a certain airspeed. We'll start here, what we can think of as our minimum speed. It has nothing to do directly with drag, but it's our stall speed. If we move this line, which is the sum of the two drags, and draw it across, we get a U-shaped curve, which is our total drag curve. The point along the total drag curve, which is the closest to the horizontal axis, or zero, is the speed where we have the least amount of drag. Any reduction or increase in speed from this point, and we'll have to accept an increase in drag. This minimum total drag is also called the maximum lift-to-drag ratio. For a given amount of lift, we have the least amount of drag at this speed. This speed is special for our aircraft. It represents our best glide speed, or VG. When we can fly with a certain amount of lift and the lowest possible drag, we can fly the furthest for a given loss of altitude. When we practice engine outs, we typically aim to be at this speed to give ourselves the best chance to glide to a safe spot. Back in normal flight, we see that in order to maintain equilibrium at a constant airspeed, we need our thrust force to equal our drag force. What this means is that we can think of our total drag curve as also representing our thrust required curve. In order to maintain any airspeed on this chart, we'll need at least as much thrust as the total drag listed on that blue U-shaped curve. What does all this have to do with climb performance though? If we have the required thrust and then some extra thrust left over, we can use that as a force to climb the aircraft. An aircraft in a climb has a good deal of lift, but because thrust has an upwards component to it, we get a climbing force from this too. There are times when we want the greatest possible climbing force to allow us to gain a certain altitude in the shortest distance traveled, most often on takeoff, trying to clear an obstacle near the runway. We're looking for our best angle of climb. It's the strongest force that will give us this, and therefore we need the most excess thrust we can muster. Excess thrust is anything left over after the required thrust. 
we all know that our aircraft will produce maximum thrust at full power, so we might think that our total thrust or thrust available curve would be a straight line, with airspeed having no effect, and so our excess thrust would be shown by this line. If we were flying a jet, we might be right, but a propeller aircraft is actually able to produce more thrust at lower speeds because at higher angles of attack, our blade is taking a bigger bite of air. So our thrust available curve looks like this. So our maximum excess thrust doesn't come at the same speed where we have minimum drag, but actually happens at a bit of a slower airspeed around here, where that dashed line is the longest. It's at this speed, not at VG, where we'll find what's called our best angle of climb speed, or VX. So in trying to climb that obstacle in front of the runway, VX will give us the greatest force lifting us to altitude in the shortest distance traveled. It's important to note that VX is less than VG and is on the left side of this total drag curve. When we start considering the power curve of the engine and how stability at slower speeds affects us, we'll learn some important things about VX.